okay, well done. If you've got to this stage, then it means that you've now uh, taken the, uh, the signal of events that you've generated, uh, you've then passed them through some analysis code looking at truth level, and you've managed to plot a number of those distributions. So you're already an expert, well, not quite yet, but you should hopefully be getting a good idea of how the Atlas collaboration works. Um, and so now, to take the next step, we're actually going to take a giant leap, and then we're going to try and break it down into, the, to, into different sections. But the time now is to take the blinders off. Um, the analysis that we were working with before was a very low-level analysis working on variables that we have access to, okay? This so-called truth information, which isn't really available in real data, okay? So if I, if I have this kind of diagram at the bottom, what you did was create the EVNT, these, these truth events with a generator, and then we kind of skipped to the last step and made that into a format which we could then read in some very basic Atlas analysis code. In reality, what we have to do to get the full picture, and, and the, the key here is to make the simulation as close to the data as possible, because of course the real data is going to give us the answers uh, of whether new physics exists or not. What we have to do with the simulation is we start with the generator to generate all of the different standard model processes and even beyond the standard model processes that we know about. Then what we have to do, because that's just generating the, the, PP, uh, the, the PP collisions, uh, creating the particle and then its decay products, what we then have to do to, to actually see what the detector would see is we go to the next step in the chain called simulation, which essentially wraps the real detector, or our best description of the detector, around that underlying event. It also simulates not just the single proton-proton collision, but all of the pile-up of other collisions that may happen because we have bunches of 10 to the 10 protons passing by each other every 25 nanoseconds. Uh, so any of those secondary collisions are also simulated at this point. Uh, the, the program that does all of this extra simulation of the detector is called Géant 4. It's actually used in many particle physics experiments. And then once we've kind of seen how the detector reacts to uh, all of these particles traveling through different parts of the detector, kind of like I drew earlier, right, and it would leave ionization tracks and energy deposits and so forth, the next step is then to run all of our reconstruction algorithms over all of these hits and deposits in the detector to try and understand what they mean, okay? So here, the, the big coding framework that is used is called Athena, um, but basically it's a number of different algorithms so that, let's say, you know, we were looking for muons and we had tracks in the inner, we had deposits, ionization deposits in the inner detector, and we also had some hits in the muon spectrometer. Well, what the reconstruction algorithm would do would try and turn those hits into a muon. So we'd try a number of fits to try and fit a, a, a track through all of these hits inside the silicon in the inner detector and the TRTs in the inner detector and try and match those to hits in the muon spectrometer to try and figure out that really this is signaling the path of a muon. So the reconstruction stage really tries to turn all of the signals that we get from the detector into recognizable objects. And then finally we have this AOD stage where all of that information gets simplified and put in the object-oriented format that we can then as experimentalists use. Okay? So this is the full chain when we're doing the simulation of every physics process that we're interested to look at, whether it be standard model or beyond the standard model physics. And really, data takes a shortcut here, right? Nature provides us with the LHC, colliding protons provides us with this information of real data, which we can't really see, right? We, we, don't, we can't look at the truth information in data. The real detector gives us this part, right, um, for real data. We have the electronic signals which are being read out from the real part of the detector. And then where we connect back in with our simulation is that we run the same reconstruction algorithms that we run on the simulation. We run that on the real data as well. And then we do the same conversion of the real data into our final AOD objects. So at that stage, we can analyze real data and we can analyze our simulations and make a one-to-one -one comparison between them. Now, when you were doing selection and looking at the different variables from those Z prime events previously, you were looking at some simple variables like the transverse momentum and the eta and phi direction. 
Okay, so those are things which you have accessible here, but as you build up this real picture of an event and the objects in it, things get much more messy, right? So it, you could have, for example, in the real detector, you could have tracks which don't fit well, right? Maybe not all of these chambers had hits in them, so you couldn't get a very good fit going through to give you your muon. Or maybe you had an electron that was so energetic it punched out of the electromagnetic calorimeter and into the hadronic calorimeter. So how do you know whether it's a jet or it's an electron? And these are real world decisions that we have to make as experimentalists. So um, if, I, if I take on the, the right hand side here, this is an event selection that would be applied in a real analysis looking for, let's say, a Z prime decaying to two muons. Now let's take muons just to move over. We were talking about electrons before, still leptons, but here instead of looking for deposits in a, in a detector, we'll be looking for objects that traverse all the way out to the muon spectrometer. But the, the analysis for two electrons would be very similar. So what we would ask when we we're doing our real analysis so first of all, when you're looking at data, you have something called the good runs list, the GRL. So I won't go into that in too much detail now, but basically it's a set of uh, flags that tell you if the a detector was operating nominally during the time that we were taking the real data. You know, let's say that the, the inner detector, the power went out, or maybe there was an extra amount of electronic noise in the eCal so you can't get good readings for electrons. And then a flag will be switched that say, says don't use real data during this period. So this one actually only applies to data, um, but it, it would then allow you to make sure that the data you're looking at is of the highest quality. Okay? So automatically everything in the simulation passes that because we simulate ideal conditions and we make sure that matches the data by making sure that data also then passes these, uh, these threshold conditions. So then we go on to the next cut that you would make. So in each of these cases, you're going to come to this diagram as well as the, the amount of events you're accepting into your selection. Let's take the trigger, for example. So I talked earlier about the fact that uh, we have over you know, 40 million collisions per second uh, at the LHC, and we're only able to write 1,000 of those per second to disk. So this is where the trigger menu comes in, um, and there are many triggers that are run on the real data to then cut down how many events that you will actually see. And so therefore in our simulation, we also have to uh, recreate that fraction of events that we would collect out of the total uh, that would be passing through the detector. Okay, so if for example, let's give an example of a trigger for muons, you might say, okay, record this event, if you see two muons that have a PT of greater than 15 GeV. So every time it sees an event which has two muons, which have a very low but meaningful threshold of, of 15 GeV, then it writes that to disk. Okay? Now we can't record all of those events, some fraction of them get recorded. And so we'll come to this plot for the first time, which is the acceptance times efficiency, basically how many events are you selecting out of the total possible, versus the dimuon invariant mass, so the mass of the dimuon system. Okay? And so the way you calculate this is, you know, at truth level, um, at least with the simulation, uh, you could figure out what the mass of your dimuon pair is, and so for your total sample, you might say you have a certain number. Well, now let's see how many of those pass each of these uh, selection criteria. So for example, if we take the trigger, which is this first line, at very low mass, well maybe the leptons are below 15 GeV PT. Therefore the trigger, let's say there was one muon with 10 GeV and another one with 20 GeV. Okay? Therefore that wouldn't pass this trigger, which is requiring two muons to have greater than 15 GeV. Therefore if the trigger doesn't fire, then even though you had an event with this 10 and 20 GV muon, it wouldn't select it, right? So your efficiency is then less than 1 because the total number you're accepting is maybe 8, and the, out of the total number that were in that range was 10, so you have, say, an 80% efficiency there, okay? But as you get to higher and higher mass, that's implying that the, the momentum of the, the muons is higher and higher, therefore you know, if you're out at 3 TeV, then all of the muons are going to have a PT way higher than 15 GeV, and so you'll see almost all of the events 
uh, because they have way higher than two uh, muons with, with 15 GV. So the efficiency is very, very high out here. Then the next selection that you could make, well, we're interesting in Z prime decaying to two leptons or two muons in this case. So we can just simply ask, are there two or more muons in the event? Maybe you want to ask for exactly two muons, okay? So you'd have some efficiency loss because there'd be events with one muon in it. Or, well, maybe not because of the trigger, but if you, if you ask for exactly two, then there will be some events with four muons in it and so forth, so you can cut those away. Uh, the next cut, which makes a, a big difference, and this uh, threshold can be chosen, but you then ask that the two muons that you've selected are not just above this trigger threshold, but are higher PT. So here I use 20 GV, you could use 30 GV, and therefore again you see that you're taking a hit. This is now the total acceptance times efficiency, so it's the effect of the trigger and the two lepton requirement, and now the PT requirement again on top of that, then you can see that our total acceptance times efficiency has then gone down again, okay? Um, another selection you usually make is to check that the leptons are within a certain eta acceptance. We talked about eta previously. And then one really important concept, which is different apart from the trigger, you know, these you've kind of been dealing with before in your truth level analysis. But now you come to some other variables which aren't accessible at that truth level, and it's really only when you do this full chain you get to real life that you start to see. So there's something here called the high PT identification requirement. Okay? And so the issue is that if we, if we take our detector here and we have muons traversing the detector, how do we figure out how much energy they have? Well, we're in a magnetic field, and so charged particles will curve in this magnetic field as they traverse the detector. And if you think about it, that the muon has a certain mass, the higher the momentum, the higher the energy, the less chance or the more resistance there is to the magnetic field bending that muon. Therefore, generally straighter muons will be higher energy, right? So lower, lower energy ones, you know, if they're very low energy, the magnetic field can even, you know, make them spiral. We see that in, in some cloud chamber experiments. When we get into higher and higher energy, then they leave the detector, but you can see they're bending. And then the higher and higher momentum they get, the straighter they get. And so one issue is when they get this straight, you know, how do you tell the difference between a very straight and an extremely straight track? Okay, if we're trying to calculate the energy from this curvature, it becomes extremely hard. And the other thing is, especially when we're, because this becomes so precise, we need to know exactly where that muon traveled through the detector. So this high PT muon requirement is requiring that for very straight tracks, we have a very good number of hits in the inner detector. So we could say that you have at least five hits in the inner detector, and at least three hits in the outer detector because that allows you to draw a very precise line through all of those points. You can know exactly where the muon is, right? And therefore, we have a very good estimate of how much energy it has. Um, if, for example, you instead have a muon that only has one hit in the inner detector and one hit in one of the chambers in the muon spectrometer, well, then the line that you can draw between those points can be very, you know, is very uncertain. So the uncertainty on your muon might be, you know, hundreds of GeV, even, you know, a TeV or more. So you could be erroneously seeing extremely high PT muons, like 10 TeV, something way off this plot. But it's not because there's a really a muon of that energy, it's because the reconstruction has to some extent failed. So this high PT muon requirement uh, loses a lot of efficiency. You, you throw away many of events, but you do that to make sure that the events that you do select are very pure, very low uncertainty and safe to use. We, we, we think that we understand them well. So as opposed to these exceptional size efficiency curves, you have some quick turn on of the efficiency. There's some losses, right, even for low energy muons. But then you can see as we get to higher and higher PT, this efficiency starts to drop off because it becomes harder and harder to identify these muons, right, a higher and higher PT. However, even though we're throwing many away, we're keeping the ones which are like the golden channel, the ones that we can really trust. And that can sometimes be more important than just keeping as many muons as possible. This is something that's continually being worked on, trying to improve this while not sacrificing uh, you know, the, the, the robustness of our estimates. Um, and 
the, there are some other concepts here. One is you can just make an invariant mass cut, and the other one is about isolation. This is more relevant to electrons, but you can look in the detector at how much energy is around uh, your object as it passes through, because maybe that muon is inside of a jet, right? And maybe that's throwing off your calculation. So generally we ask that there's not much energy deposited in the detector around our objects. So again, we know that we're making a precise measurement. It's not adding extra noise. So this is, when we go on to perform a real analysis, this is more what the event selection will look like and will get us as close to the data as possible, okay? And so when we go on to this next stage, you will actually be performing this uh, on many physics processes and running over the data so that we can make a comparison between them. Now, uh, up until now as well, you've only been looking at the Z prime signal. And I mentioned in the previous talk about the standard model distribution that you would see. So let's go back to our friend uh, here, the dielectron invariant mass distribution. And again, here, this time I'm talking about two muons. Okay, and now I've even drawn an, a scale on the y-axis, so the number of events here, I've gone up to 10 to the 7 events, um, and you can even scale it to less than 1, you can have 10 to the minus 1 events here, you just would never expect data to be fractional because of course you only see integer number, numbers of data events, but you could still, still scale your Monte Carlo to any number you like. And now instead of just having that one black line uh, showing you the falling distribution, what I've actually split it apart into now is all of the different standard model processes that you would see when you're looking in this channel. So still by far the most dominant uh, uh, process that you would see uh, in proton-proton collisions at the LHC, uh, looking in this channel for dimuons, the same as for dielectrons, you would see the Z and gamma process. So you would see standard model uh, Z bosons being created, decaying to two electrons. However, you would also see other processes as well. So you could have TT bar. So I'll let you look up more about that process, but essentially the, each top quark can decay uh, most of the time, almost entirely of the time, to a W boson and a B quark. And that W boson then can further decay to other things such as quarks, but including a lepton and a neutrino. So if you had two top quarks that both decay to a W and a, and a B, and then both of those Ws decay to a lepton and a neutrino, well, you'd have two leptons in the event. So you might pick up some of those events in your selection. Now, because of things like the isolation requirement, you hope to minimize those number of events, but some will still sneak through into your selection. So as well as running over a standard model Z simulated sample, you need to run over a TT bar sample. You could have W plus jets, so where a W boson that decays to leptons is produced in association with jets, and one of those jets might fake, a, fake an electron or a muon. Much harder for muons, but very common for electrons. Um, and then you can even have other processes like diboson process where two Ws are created, which both decay to leptons. Or maybe a W and a Z is created, and you know, you, there you could potentially have the Z decaying to leptons, and the W decaying to quarks or leptons, so you could have two or even more leptons in the event. And so all of these have been stacked on top of each other to give us the total estimate from the standard model what we would see. And the reason we do this is because then when we run the real data here, which is in the black little crosses here, so you can see I've drawn my legend, just like you recently did when you made your nice plots uh, with the truth level analysis, uh, with the black points here for data, we want to get as close to the full simulation as possible, right? This is, all of these colored in histograms represents our best knowledge of the standard model, and we're comparing it to the data, and we want to uh, try and understand as precisely as possible if that matches. Now at this point, probably down in the corner, I will flash up a, a real image of this, not just one that I've drawn, but one from a real analysis that was recently done. And you can see usually there, there's a ratio subplot which shows you the ratio of your uh, estimate, uh, simulated estimate compared to data. And you can see that generally the agreement is good, which means up until now we haven't found any new physics out of high mass. But with the more data we collect, we're populating these tails. So I've drawn here an integrand symbol with L for integrated luminosity, which has units of inverse barns. Here for the scale, we've gone to inverse Fenter bombs. And so currently at the LHC of time of writing, 
Uh, we've collected around 139 inverse fentabalms of data, and now we've just started run three, so we're collecting even more data. But essentially, the more data you collect, the more, just think of it as the more events that you're putting into these bins, right? So this whole distribution is going to be moving up in the number, and you can imagine as this number moves up, then you're expecting around one event out at high mass, and the higher up it goes, the more you expect events to be filled out in this tail, which allows us to search for new physics at higher and higher mass, okay? So, you know, this is the big picture of what we're heading to next. But in reality, you know, I'm not going to ask you to go through this whole generation chain for all of these different processes, and you will also need millions and millions of events to be able to, you know, have an accurate simulation. You know, here we have roughly 10 to the 7 events, right? So you can imagine how many events we have to generate at Monte Carlo to be able to appreciate that, okay? So in reality, there's also a way that you can download samples that people have already generated. In fact, there are whole groups of, of you know, tens to hundreds of people at Atlas who are dedicated to giving the most accurate representation of the standard model in these samples as possible. So you're actually going to download or use some that I would have already downloaded to the tier three and then run a real analysis over those, download some real data Okay, probably just from 2015, 2016, the data we collected to have a smaller data set that's manageable, and then run over that same analysis through the data, and then you're going to make an equivalent of this plot, okay, where you compare the data to our simulation. And then you can also perform the statistical analysis to see how well that agrees. You know, we don't want to just look by eye and say, ah, that's about right. We then want to actually use statistical tools to give us a quantitative statement about the agreement that we're seeing. Okay? So that will be the next stage that you'll be going on to, and I'll meet you back here after that. Thank you very much.